Just uh, a few minutes really to take uh, some quick questions before we do head to the morning tea break. Please don't be shy about coming forward to a microphone and telling us who you are and where you're from and questions please as opposed to statements if you don't mind. While people are uh, getting to microphones I think. Um, Chris, has, um, has Michael rained on your parade at all or, is it, or do we just party hard in 2017? Um, so so the, um, Michael's stuff was brilliant. Um, let me come back uh, to something very simple. Uh, Barnaby uh, put it in terms of uh, does it make sense for Tennessee to trade with Tennessee? Does it make sense for Idaho to try, trade with Idaho? You can't drive around in potatoes, uh, he should have added. Um, it is exactly 200 years ago uh, that David Ricardo uh, made a very obvious point um, about trade. He said it makes sense for us all to do what we're best at doing uh, and trade those surpluses. And that has done magnificent things uh, for prosperity over a very long period of time. Um, I guess I'd, I'd say that the essence of, of Michael's point uh, is that politics can get in the way of that good economics. Um, entirely possible. But let's remember first how good those economics are. Um, the world, you know, and, and Asia, um, is much, much richer now, and a hell of a lot of that uh, owes itself uh, to trade. Um, and it's entirely possible, you know, because the politics of, of Odia, you know, they, they sell more to us than we buy, you know, et cetera. Uh, the politics of that is really seductive, but when people start to move uh, in favour of uh, solitaire, uh, that's a game they lose really fast. Uh, Michael noted, you know, if the US does that, uh, the uh, the US dollar goes up, um, which, by the way, is the fastest possible way to lose even more manufacturing jobs uh, in the US uh, um, Rust Belt. Um, and also says that that trade deficit, which uh, you know, is big, but not, in fact, spectacular, um, the trade deficit would get worse that way um, rather than better. So, yeah, politicians can do dumb things. That is entirely true. Um, but we know more now, um, you know, that we, you will see that dumbness play out really quite fast. Um, I'm not saying that dumb things can't happen, uh, but I truly doubt uh, that dumb things will stand uh, the test of time. Now, question over here. Uh, thank you, David Mitchell Cross Holdings. This one's for Michael. I looked with interest at your slide about where the currencies come from to trade in blocks. What's your view on cryptocurrencies? Cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm not a huge fan, to be honest. We are actually at an interesting juncture because many things that we hold as, as normal are breaking down on many fronts. Uh, and one sign of that is the emergence of cryptocurrencies, which are, you know, are filling a gap. Uh, I don't want to name them you know, one by one and go through. At the moment, because they don't actually have anything physical underlying them at all, that there's literally nothing behind them, um, they're just really a vehicle for speculation. Uh, and one particular one that starts with the letter B is primarily being used as a proxy for capital flight out of China, which, by the way, is a really, really important indicator to watch because uh, if you want an understanding of whether China really is doing well or not underneath the surface, look at what capital flight is doing because regardless of what we think as outsiders looking in, capital flight tells you what the insiders feel and how much money they're trying to get out shows you how they feel. And the fact that this particular cryptocurrency called B is going through the roof tells you something. Thank you. Any other questions? Just quickly, um, Michael, you, from your presentation, what I really got out of it was uh, observations about quite long-term cycles. And through that, are you saying that inevitably we are going back in this other direction now, which may not be uh, all beer and Skittles? Well, I think inevitably we will, because Talking about the Ricardian paradigm again, I, I try and use this analogy with uh, you know with clients. Imagine you know you're a parent with two children. You've got chores around the house. One of them's fantastic at tidying up all the books and the papers and whatever and putting them nice and neatly, and one of them really excels at cleaning the toilet. And you say, well, it's much more efficient if you always clean the toilet, and you always clean up. You know, you line the books up nice and neatly by colour. Is that going to play well in your house? 
It's much more efficient. You know, unless you've got some serious rewards and rebalancing within the family to say, well, you do that, and therefore, you know, you, you get, I'll take you to Macca's twice a week or something as compensation. It's not going to work. And we have a global economy, which is highly efficient, and we don't have a global government to compensate the people who are effectively cleaning the toilets permanently, because that's where they're efficiently allocated. And until we get that, I don't see how it avoids breaking down. I mean, I've been predicting someone like Trump for a while. I didn't think it was going to be him. <laughs> but uh, it seems to me we're in for a rocky road ahead. Michael, thank you. Could you. I'm going to draw a line there because we are now officially into the morning tea break. Our speakers this morning, Michael Every, Chris Richardson and Peter Gooday. Could you please thank them?